this church for so many years. And I know Pastor Lawrence always said great men no, need no introduction. And this man truly needs no introduction at this church because he's been a friend and he's been somebody that this church has looked up to for nearly 30 years. Let's make welcome one of our dearest friends of Solid Rock Church, Dwight Thompson. Hallelujah. Well, let's give the clap offering to the King, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. If you don't mind, uh, remain standing just a moment. Let me thank you from the bottom of uh, my heart for this wonderful, 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 wonderful privilege. I say it every time I come here. I say it to my wife. I say it to pastors. I wish my whole family could be here and go to this church. Uh, when I wasn't off preaching, we'd be right here on the front seat. Sister, Pastor Darlene or Pastor Lawrence would be preaching and I'd be throwing my boot at them, shouting hallelujah, just keep going. I was looking at all these little folks that got happy enough to run around. I was thinking about if all the world knew why they're running shouting they're just getting tuned up for heaven I'm gonna be shouting on the hills of glory if the whole world can go crazy over a ball that doesn't even bounce right it's about time born-again Christians just shout it from the housetop anybody want to shout it hallelujah I'm gonna pray in just one one moment but I just want to say something to Pastor Lawrence here I just somehow think that your father is hanging over heaven tonight, seeing you and that powerful role you have stepped into. And just something in my spirit while you were singing, I just could see your precious dad looking over the balcony of heaven watching you, saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Man of God, Pastor Lawrence Bishop II. Did you see him on Trinity the other night again? People, people love him. And then the mama that's made everything happen around here. One of the most powerful, dynamic, uncompromising Holy Ghost anointed no backing up no turning back no compromise your co-pastor of this great church Pastor Darlene Bishop tell her how much you love her tonight so let's give both of your pastors a great big hand and tell them how much we love them tonight And not to leave out, where's Brother Johnny over there? Where is he? I'm telling you, anybody that sings that good ought to be slapped. <laughs> but I won't be doing that, and I don't recommend anybody else doing it. What a gift and what a talent. Brother Johnny and all this great, great, great choir. Can you handle one more minute? Let me introduce my girlfriend, my wife. Sunday. Is it Sunday? Is it the ninth? Work with me here, Zonel. Look at me. Work with me. How long have we been together now? She, she's going to see her, that, that look thing that got me there. I, I know I'm just messing with you. Yes. Yes, they said we wouldn't make it. I'm not sure we're out of the woods, but Sunday we'll be married 53 years. 53. Yikes. So I told her, I think we've got it made now. She said, you're not out of the woods yet, but you better watch it. Better watch it. It's been quite a journey, hasn't it? So just think. I promised you Hawaii. I haven't got you there yet, starting on the 50th. So we're going we're to be in church Sunday right here. And it's going to be a great time. Hallelujah. Join hands with somebody. We're honored to be here. Say this with me out loud. Holy Spirit, tonight... Let not one little boy, one little girl, one man, one woman 
that maybe they don't know Christ, that they will not be able to get out of this building without knowing everything in their heart is right with God. Holy Spirit, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Well, let's give the Lord a thunderous ovation here tonight. And you may be seated. I was called to be an evangelist a long time ago, and if you'll let me tonight, I'd like to just feel the role of an evangelist. That's my calling. I want to speak to you tonight for a few minutes upon something that you don't hear much across this nation except at Solid Rock because they preach it all, the gospel. I've selected tonight a subject that I want to talk about that I believe has been totally, almost I should say, without exception in most circles, people have taken their eye off of eternity. I think we're so close to the coming of the Lord and the rapture of the church, we ought to start having rapture drills. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what that means, but I, I like to say it for some reason. Uh, and for you that don't know what I'm talking about, you're going to know it when it happens. It's going to be like the blink of an eye. Now you see me, and now you don't. We're going to be caught up. Are there any rapture people in the house tonight? Somebody get up and just sort of jump and see if you get airborne. Just go ahead and give it a shot. Kind of practice it. Somebody just get up and kind of like jump. And th only one person's going to make it out of this whole crowd here, here tonight. Well, it's going to happen. So I want to speak tonight on the subject, keeping your eye on eternity. Matthew chapter 24, if you'll please turn with me in your Bibles with me. Please do that. I, I just need a, here it is right here. Thank you for the water. Matthew chapter 24, begin with verse 42, uh, 32. I'll get it right. I want to go to 37. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were, everybody say that, eating and drinking and they were marrying and they were giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. In other words, everything up until the very hour that was going to be for that generation the most cataclysmic hour for those that are outside the ark up until that very moment everything was continuing as it had always been the next verse says they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away so shall the coming of the son of man be then there shall be two men in the field, and one will be taken, and then one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this that if the head of the house had known in what hour or time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert, would not have allowed his house to be broken into. And for this reason, you be ready too, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think that he will. Father, Holy Spirit, Add your anointing to this. Hide this humble, inadequate preacher behind the holy cross of Jesus Christ, I pray. In Christ's name. And everybody shout amen and amen and amen. I was thinking about something that in preparation for this message tonight, there are three things that I want to bring to your attention that you have no control over. 
I realize there may be some that can get this information, and some do, but for the most part, every man, every woman, every boy in this girl, uh, in this room tonight, when you will die, you simply do not know the hour that you could be unexpectedly called away propelling you into that word that we call eternity. Now listen to me very closely. This is very important. I'll never forget, not very long ago, a couple of years as I recall, I was getting ready to go host a program on Praise the Lord in Dallas. We were at the hotel and uh, two or three people that were going to be on the program were in the car. And, making our way to go to the studio for the program. And we kept waiting on one of our guests. And our guest that was coming was a man that was, we had gotten the information that Laura, our, that does most of the booking for all of the programs, said, I have never talked to anybody on the phone that we invited that was more excited about being on a program than he was to be on this program. And his subject that he was going to speak on or in his book that he had written, How I Had Gone to Heaven and Come Back. And he had had a death experience, pronounced dead, but he came back. So this was going to be his testimony on that night. So he had already experienced eternity for whatever period of time, but the Lord said, no, I'm not letting you come all the way. You're going on back. So he was going to come with this book and tell the folks about his experience about going to heaven and then returning to finish out his assignment on earth. We waited and waited and waited in the car, but to no avail. Finally, we had to go on to the studio, and we finally concluded probably a friend, somebody had picked him up and taken him on to the studio. When we got to the studio, he wasn't there. Moments before we began to go on, go on and begin to uh, take the program and get it going, minutes before we did this, somebody gave me a note literally minutes before we went on the air and said these words said security went ahead but to make sure he was all right and went into his room and they found him uh, pastor darling sitting at the table and he had a sandwich and a bowl of soup and he was fully dressed had his bible everything to go getting him a last little meal before he could get on television and talk about going to heaven and coming back and letting folks know that there is a real heaven except they found him he had the most peaceful look on his face he didn't make it to the program this time when he went to heaven he didn't come back to earth I thought about that so many times. How many people in this hour that have absolutely no inclination of when they are going to meet eternity through the keyhole or the doorway of death, if you will. I remember vividly talking on the telephone to my brother on December the 6th, 1970. It was Saturday evening. And we had talked. He had been out of town for a week or so. And I loved my baby brother. And I said, I'll see you Sunday. We had a wonderful conversation. He said, I'll be making my way back. And I'll be back there in time for church on Sunday. I did not know when I hung up that phone that that would be the last conversation I would have with my best friend, who at that time was my 29-year-old brother. The phone call came that very Saturday night. And my father said that you need to hurry with me. And the family were headed to Tyler, Texas, 125 miles away. Your brother has been in an automobile accident. 125 miles, we journeyed rapidly, walked inside that emergency room, and there lay my brother. And he uh, was a young uh, man, 29 years of age, but even as a boy, he was a skinny little guy, if you will. 
because he had had an illness and, and he had uh, built his body up and he became a weightlifter and he was now one of these specimens of a young man. I remember as a child walking with my mother. My vivid memory, my mother would tell me I was four. I can remember my mother walking with my baby brother through the night in the lighted hallway when they said he will never live because of this condition in his body. And she would beat back along with my father the, the, the hand of death and God gave my baby brother a miracle at the age of two. Well, here at the age of 29, now he needs another miracle. There's my mother in that room asking the Lord to heal her son. There's my father. There I am. There we all are. He lived 11 hours and 45 minutes. I remember vividly Pastor Darlene going in there and praying every kind of prayer that I knew to pray. And it went something like this. Here I am now a young minister and I'd been preaching just a, a few years. So I'm, pre I'm praying now, Lord, I believe in faith. And I command this, uh, this uh, the miracle to take place, but nothing took place. So then I went back in there and I thought, well, I used some kind of persuasion on God. And I said, now, Lord, if you don't want to do it for me, do it for my daddy. My daddy's preached before he went to heaven 65 years, but I said, he's a faithful man. He preaches the gospel. Why don't you do it for him? He tells people you're the healer. This is a good time to show up and do the healing. Then I thought of everything else. He has a new baby that's less than a year old. Why don't you heal him because his little son's going to need him? Then I thought of everything else. And then I finally just kind of got aggravated. And I said, why don't you do it just because you can do it? After all, I've been going around the country telling everybody you're the healer. Why don't you just do it because you can do it? And I'll go around the country telling everybody how you raised my baby brother up. But they walked out of that room that 11 hours and 45 minutes later, and they said he was gone. I was mad at God for a little while, but I got over that pretty quickly when God straightened me out in a hurry. But I don't want to get too far afield from my message, and that was this. I had no idea that the last conversation I would have, that 11 hours and 45 minutes later, he would be in eternity. Zonel, you remember when we heard about Dale in Palm Springs, California. He and his wife, and her name was Arlene, and he and his wife were watching me preach one night standing before the judgment bar of God. It was a two-part message. Part one, I had just preached. Part two, I said, will be next week. And I went off of the air and said, be sure and tune in for the final part next week. And then he, the testimony would come later, said to his wife, if she went into the kitchen to get them a cup of coffee or a snack or something, he said, let's not forget to hear the second part of the message next, next week. And Arlene said, I went into the office, to, uh, to the kitchen to fix him something to eat. And then I heard him say, Arlene, Arlene walked back in there and he had slumped over with the last two words out of his mouth Arlene Arlene I want to give you one more quick illustration Joe Dixon one of our boyhood friends came to hear me preach in Fort Worth Texas on a Sunday night I preached on the subject called heaven that heaven is real it's not the figment of imagination but it's real I want to remind everybody here tonight that heaven is real he said I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be off. Somebody shout with me tonight. It's real. He left out of that place and we went out to lit dinner after church. We sat and talked. You remember that, Zonel? At that mac macaroni grill, I think it was called. And he was, for some reason, wanted to talk more and now tell me more about heaven something on the inside was beginning to get his eye on eternity he went home and the next day talked to his pastor tell me more about heaven 
And a few days later, his wife would later say it was almost like he had a premonition. It was the last time I saw him and the last time I talked to him within a matter of days. We were at his funeral, and I thought about that. That's what he talked about, heaven. So, my friend, eternity for every one of us may come through the doorway called death. But no, wait. To you that are born again, we don't weep as others. It's transition from mortality. I feel a shout coming on right now. Thinking about that woman sitting on the front seat that got happy while I was preaching something and she's holding her baby and jumped up and said, I feel a shout coming on. She said to the lady next to her, hold my baby. And that woman said, you hold your own baby. I feel a shout coming on too. And I must say tonight, talking about this, I feel a shout coming on on this platform. My dad preached it 65 years, and his son is preaching it here tonight that I'm here to tell you that thing called death. We do not sorrow as others, but I'm here to tell you the last moment that you take your breath as a child of a living God, you don't go and stop in purgatory that somebody's got to buy you out of that. You're going to go straight from here into the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Everybody shout eternity. Eternity. I ask you tonight, do you believe that there is an eternity for every one of us? Now this, this changes the dynamic for just a moment, and I want to talk about this. People that have taken their eye off of eternity have lost the sensitivity in their soul to the Spirit of God. Do you know why Solid Rock Church is different than so many of the churches? That, that there's no spirit, there's no life. There is no way that you can place importance enough upon keeping your heart sensitive to the Spirit of God. Do you realize that day that you came to the Lord, you may not even remember the title of the message, nor the text, nor possibly even the name of the man or woman of God that delivered it. But there's one thing about that night that you remember. Something on the inside of you was tugging at your soul. Something that the singing was different. The sermon was different. Something inside of you was saying, I gotta have that. I can't wait any longer. You know what it was, don't you? Of course you do. That was the divine intervention of the Holy Spirit that, and I feel it here tonight that penetrated your old hard heart and you may have heard a dozen or two dozen or a hundred sermons in the course of your life in church or television or radio or something but that night something happened that spirit penetrated that spirit got a hold of you and the scripture says that nobody can come to God unless the spirit brings him it is the spirit of God the Holy Ghost that calls you to realize I need what that preacher is saying I can't stand it any longer oh God help the pastors and the preachers of America not to just get some kind of little sermon oh but that they will understand that the word is dead without the spirit and the anointing of the Holy Ghost <laughs> hallelujah 
how many people imagine this? Because I don't know. And this is, is also our 50th year beginning last month of Zonel and I preaching this gospel across this land. This is really significant, isn't it, Darnell, now that I think about it. And, and I, I think about how many times I've preached in churches or wherever it may be or auditoriums or television, whatever it may be. And how many people in a auditorium will, in a secular auditorium that will get up and come to God and then maybe I can conservatives say at times like thousands. But what always shocks me, even if it's a Pentecostal church and you're preaching a message and the Holy Ghost is so strong it's indescribable and you give an appeal if you've never given your life to Christ and it's almost as they say like the anointing is so great you could just like touch it you could almost tangibly see it it's surreal and it may be half of that entire Sunday morning crowd that'll get up and come forward in a church where they would later say, we never felt the Spirit of God like that. How many churches are packed on Sunday? And one pastor said, we haven't had one convert in two years in this church. And I don't get that, and yet I do. Because all of the harmonizing in Scripture and all of the theological training and all of that cannot take the place of that and only that that can move the person that's sitting on the pew, and that is the divine anointing of the Holy Ghost. Do you know why Pastor Darlene Bishop and why Pastor Lawrence Bishop is shaking people everywhere? They don't go into a pulpit in their own wisdom and in their own might, but they go under the mighty anointing and the unction of the Holy Ghost. What we need in America is not another denomination, but we need a demonstration of the power of Almighty God. And then the third thing that I want to talk to you about quickly is this. To me, the tragedy of all tragedies is not the people that have never heard the name of Jesus in their lifetime. But I think the tragedy of all tragedies are the people that have learned to sit in a church service and learn to manipulate the spirit learn to resist it and push it away they, they can actually clap their hands go through the motions but never deal with that sin that's in their life. Or they've heard some preachers say, you don't have to repent. Repent, Christ died for your sin. That takes care of everything and everybody. You can go out, as I heard one preacher say not very long ago, well-known preacher, and sin all you want to now, and you'll never, ever have to use the word repent. Did you know that is a lie? It truthfully in my heart. Do you realize that the, the, that the very proclamation of the beginning of the Lord of our life, Jesus Christ, is a baby? And they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. John would preach, prepare ye the way of the Lord, repent, for the way of the Lord is at hand. I'm here tonight to let you understand something and something that's important. Don't you listen to the misrepresentative of the word grace. 
That isn't a license to go out and do anything that you want to do because the consequences of sin is still death. So the tragedy to me of all tragedies are the people that have sat under the influence of the Holy Spirit and have learned to never, ever be moved or touched by the Spirit of God. There's a song that says, down through the years I've heard God's, God's voice and I felt guilt for turning him aside. Then one day that voice stopped calling and a hardened heart had taken over my life. I heard Dr. W.A. Criswell, who's now in heaven, the pastor of the First Baptist in those years for 50 years of the great church in Dallas, Texas called First Baptist. I heard him tell the story, and I only get to the end of it. A man that he preached the funeral of his daughter that was seven years old. Then he said to the pastor, Griswold, would you ride with me on the way to the cemetery? And Dr. Criswell said, I will. And they rode in silence through the streets of downtown Dallas. In a moment, he went by a corner of a skyscraper building there in that corner. He said, I used to shine shoes on that corner. And cardboard was in the bottom of my shoes because the soles were worn out and I vowed someday I'll buy this corner and build a skyscraper I own that building don't I doctor Dr. Crystal said I know you do and he said Dr. Crystal said suddenly something in my spirit was moved because it was more than the loss of a daughter that was now troubling him to the core he said, my daughter's in heaven, but he said, Dr. Crystal, I don't know what's happened to me. He said, when you first came to our church, he said, you would preach. And you were a young man, and I'd reach out and hold on to the back of the pew in front of me because the conviction would be so great. And he said, I'd literally have to hold on to it to fight back when your appeal to come forward was given. And he said, then the next week, and then the next month, and the next year, you're a better preacher, but after the years have gone by, now I feel nothing. I don't care about salvation. I, I don't feel anything, and you're a far better preacher than when you first came. I show up, but it's a social place to be. But tell me, Dr. Criswell, what's happened to me? My daughter's in heaven, and I'm afraid. And Dr. Criswell said it became my responsibility that you're very close to the point of no return, that my spirit, saith the Lord, will not always strive with man. Even though that I know that Solid Rock Church is a spirit-led church, don't you ever take for granted when we sense that Holy Ghost that moves. Let your heart spring open and say, Holy Ghost, do the work that you want to do in my life because when you go into eternity, you will never make it in the presence of God if your heart has become hardened against God. And the third and final thing is this. Listen to me closely. You don't know when he is coming. I submit to you that if the people in America do you realize that 95% all of the preachers in the world preach in America and Canada? Less than 5% of the population of the world has 95% of those that proclaim the gospel. 
and we are rapidly becoming a nation that no longer hears about the most important message that we must, as preachers, be preaching right now. Do you realize that if people actually believed in America that Jesus Christ's coming was imminent? That even on a Wednesday night, if they were looking for the coming of the Lord, there would not be enough room in buildings with the steeple on top that even on a Wednesday night they would be sensitive to the words of our Lord that it is replete in his ministry. Remember this, he said, be alert in an hour when you think not the Son of Man is going to come. So then that tells me if people believe that we are on the brink of the coming of the Lord, there would be mighty revival shaking America to the foundation. But no, in an hour when the message is needed, the most, when the alarm needs to be sounded, when the preachers need to be in the pulpit, not as a bunch of little puppets running out, checking all the polls that what is popular and what is everybody wants to hear instead of trying to see how many they can get by compromising the gospel. No, no, no. They're out there wanting to be popular and saying, you're okay, I'm okay, sin all you want to, everything's okay, and people are flocking to that. But you know the scripture warns the time is going to come when men with itching ears are going to seek out those that preach a social gospel that requires no commitment to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But here's what gets my attention. Here's what gets my attention. He said, Jesus would say, there will be those that will come and will say, Lord, Lord. I don't hear anybody dealing with that. Did we not prophesy in your name? But he's going to say, to them to part from me. I never knew you. So then that tells me churches are packed with people that have been told you're okay and I'm okay. And, but he said there's going to be those that will say, Lord, Lord, I, I went to church. I I heard the message, and, you know, I, I believe you're the Son of God. Uh, I prophesied in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I, I never knew you. So here's my message as I close. You don't know when that hour of death may come, but it will propel you into eternity. You don't know how many times before my spirit will no longer strive with the soul of men. Where is that point of no return? Where, where is that crossing the deadline? Why would anybody want to delay one moment more? We're not talking about buying a house or buying a car or something like that. We're talking about where you're going to spend eternity living your life in the light of eternity knowing that he said at any moment when you least expect it he's going to come There's nothing in Scripture that says tomorrow is a day of salvation. 
I submit to you that hell is going to be greatly populated with this damnable lie that comes out of the devil's mouth that has guided many a person's life that even slips into the church now and then. And it's the words tomorrow. Don't you listen to Pastor Darlene. Don't you listen to that Pastor Lawrence. You sure don't want to pay any attention to that crazy Thompson guy because he's messing with your mind right now. You can go on out and keep that sin in there and it'll come out when it wants to and don't you mess with him. You remember what that preacher said? You can go sin all you want to and never have to repent. I'm sure looking forward to getting that guy on one of my programs, by the way. May I say? May I say? Because to me, I'm dealing with the souls of men. And when Jesus said, Jesus said, the one that repents, John announced the arrival of Jesus by saying, repent. Repent for the one that's coming after me who's worthy. I am not worthy to even latch. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, but you don't get there until you repent for the kingdom is at hand. And in a day when Jesus said, how is it that you can look and discern the change of a season the trees are changing colors. Fall is on the way. The leaves are falling. Winter is close. Bud is coming back a little bit now. And we know that spring is imminent and the flowers bloom. And all of these are signs of the seasons. And you can discern the face of the sky. I think it was Darlene Bishop I heard tell this to me. And I'm sure she's ministered it to you. The man that went to hell and was looking for somebody and that's not him that's not him and in hell he finally he said somebody asked him who are you looking for he said i'm looking for the preacher that told me a lie and i want to tell you something my precious friend you remember this, and I realize I'm preaching to a predominantly born-again, on-fire Christian congregation, but I'm preaching it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit tonight. This is called preventive maintenance. This is to make sure that this is going to keep us right where God wants us. And in an hour when everything is coming to the church and to me, to me, the most damnable thing that's happening on the planet when all hell is breaking loose in this world the greatest danger we face now are those that once preach the uncompromising truth and they've caved in to compromise in popularity in little programs my friend, remember this. The greatest crowd that will ever attend Solid Rock and every church in America and the world, the greatest crowd that those buildings will ever witness filled will be one day after the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would not want to be in the shoes of the preacher that sold out, standing behind the pulpit trying to explain to his people, I don't know how I missed it. So no wonder your pastors and this evangelist understand. If we stand before men scripture says and do not warn them of the truth and the danger of turning their backs on god 
we will have their blood on our hands. But pastors, if we warn the people, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. He wants you to understand there's only two destinations, heaven or hell. There's no in between. But he said if we warn them and show them the way and tell them the truth and they ignore it and they go into eternity without God, their blood will not be required at our hands. So tonight, my simple message that has to do with eternity is not something I concocted to come in here and try and shake everybody up to just scare them, but it's to come in here as a warning. Live your life with your eye on eternity. Don't listen to the preachers that just want to be popular. And just go after the crowds. But you listen to what Pastor Darlene Bishop says. You listen to what Pastor Lawrence Bishop II says. Because if you listen to them, they will guide you. It won't be the most popular message out there. But I would trust my children and my grandchildren's souls under their teaching. Because what really matters is... The only thing that matters is that I, as a preacher, when I stand before God, I will remember the words of Paul when he said that we are going to give a, an account before God in this massive military charge. I charge thee before God. And in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you preach the word. You don't delete it. You're not called to be a revisionist. I don't have the right to wake up one day and say, I now have a new revelation that everything the Bible has preached and delivered to us under the inspiration of God, I now am going to change everything in this seismic shift. No longer will we ever hear the word sin in this congregation from my lips. And no longer will you ever have to repent again. No longer. Not this preacher. Don't let the devil steal your promise of being in eternity with God forever. And there's only one way. It's Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Ask him to come into your heart. And if you think you have a license to go sin and do what you want to do, Please don't be misguided because the person that truly wants to go to heaven wants no part of sin. God hates sin. He gave his son to die for your sin. So there's only one way from earth to heaven. And that's Jesus Christ. And it's simple. Ask him to come in. Repent of your sin. If you've got that hidden sin and you refuse to give it up, if you truly want to be born again, it's not even debatable. Why would I hang on to a sin that I want so much, even though it costs me eternity? It's not worth it. Hell is going to be filled with people that believed a lie. Tonight, remember, you don't know when he's coming. Be ready in an hour when you think not. He's coming. Bow your heads, Heavenly Father. I've obeyed you the very best my ability will allow me. Everybody look at this preacher. No heads bowed, no eyes closed. We're going to get to it in... 120 seconds. 
There's people in this room that you have something in your life. You just simply put, you just need to make it right. You've heard, you've heard it's okay just to hang on to your sin. As a preacher said, you can go sin all that you want to. You know in your heart, you know that's not right. And you're saying, Dwight, I've got something in my life. Maybe you've never given your heart to God. Maybe your heart's got hardened. Maybe you have unforgiveness in your heart against somebody and you refuse to let it go. I've often said if that homosexual crowd can come out of the closet bragging that they're gay, it's about time born again Christians get out of their closet and begin to shout it from the house on. See, it's no disgrace to have sinned, for we've all done that, but to hang on to it and refuse to let it go. I submit to you that's the only sin God can't forgive. Well, we know that's true because he said, even if you don't forgive others, I can't, can't forgive you. So why would we quibble when it's black and white and as clear as can be? I want to ask the Holy Ghost, if there's anything in my heart that would prevent me, if Jesus comes, I can go with him. If my heart stopped beating, I'll go straight to Jesus. Or if that Holy Ghost is about to stop calling, please don't give up on me. In other words, if there's one thing in my life that you're not sure of, that prevents you from being ready to meet God. No heads bowed, no eyes closed when I count to three. You say, Dwight Thompson, I get it. Lead me in that prayer. I'm laying everything on the altar tonight. When I count to three, every man, woman, boy, and girl, that says, Dwight Thompson, let people think what they want to. That's up to them. But tonight, this is the night. I've got my eye on eternity. This is life or death. This is heaven or hell, and I don't intend to let one thing hold me back. I give it all to Jesus. If you want this prayer, you want to know a thousand percent you're ready to meet him. When I count to three, throw your hand up as high as you can get it just like that. None of that little sissy thing. Hands are already going up. I mean, get it up and hold it up there as high as you can. Right now, one, two, three, raise it up. Dwight, I want to be sure. I'm not sure, but I want to be sure. Leave it up if you're serious. Leave it up. I want to be sure. I'm not sure, but I want to be sure. Raise it up. Without one split second's hesitation, if you're sincere, only those with their hands raised, if you're sincere, you'll do it. If you want and not, you will not. On three, only those with their hands raised, come and stand right here in front of this preacher. One, two, three, get up and come. Quickly, come right now. I'm waiting on you right now. You raise your hand, get up and come. Church, let the church rejoice tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Young man, God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, young man, right here in Jesus' name. God bless you. Now, everybody look straight up here at this preacher. The Bible said when one soul is converted into heaven, into the kingdom, heaven rejoices. Well, I think there's some rejoicing going on in heaven right now. <clears throat> Pastor Darlene, come and stand with me. Pastor Lawrence, if you can, that's fine. If you can't, you're on the, on the base, I understand. But if I could ask Pastor Darlene and Pastor Lawrence one question. Of all the things you wish for your congregation and desire, what would be the foremost? I think I could answer on their behalf and just say, to know every person I pastor is going to meet Pastor Lawrence that's already there. Every one of them are ready. 
So tonight, here we are. Here we are. We're going to raise both hands up to heaven. As we can get them, it means I surrender all. And then we're going to pray this prayer. We're going to repent of our sin. And we're going to ask him to forgive us. And he promised to wash every sin away, never to be remembered against us again. So out loud pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I repent of every sin. I ask you to come into my heart. Jesus, I believe you died for my sin. I'm so grateful that you died for me. And I ask you, help me to trust you for my salvation. All fear, all doubt over my past has been washed away. I receive you right now as my Savior and Lord. And now, Lord Jesus, I'm ready. I receive you. I confess you. And I believe you're coming again. Everybody now look at this preacher. Kind of look up as if you could see beyond the ceiling and shout it out loud. I'm ready to meet you, Jesus. I'm ready. Let's do it all over this building. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready.